right, hi everyone. Welcome to our monthly brown bag. Um, this is just a general slide to um, let you know about our housekeeping rules. Um, thank you for joining us. You can find all our previous talks and the future ones on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it later. Um, for any upcoming um, brown bags in the future, please scan the QR code or go, head over to our website and um, you can see the schedule and register for the new ones. Um, in general, if you're new to our uh, virtual brown bags, uh, we talk about um, any uh, machine learning, um, data science, and all ops topics that we find interesting. And hopefully you'll find something interesting for yourself as well. I will um, just mention that uh, you will be on, on mute. Feel free to ask questions. Um, I will review them or um, answer to them after the talk. I will just um, switch off my camera to make it a little bit easier for my computer. Um, yes, so um, if you are interested in um, discovering these topics uh, further and would like to um, have a personalized training or a workshop, or uh, if you have a topic um, that you are generally interested in, um, we can help host a brand bug with the um, this specific topic um, of the discussion. So uh, feel free to reach out and contact us via this email. So the uh, this is my second um, brown bag um, session at Eliza. I'm a data scientist with Eliza. I started um, last year around September, and um, my previous uh, topic uh, was about um, speech analytics and um, this is a slight um, continuation of that because um, I recently worked on a project that um, was using uh, massive amounts of um, call conversations and um, we uh, were exploring this data, this unstructured data, uh, with the intention of um, finding some common patterns to help our customer um, analyze this data and um, I guess discover what the customers were talking about. So that's why I decided to share um, our experience with the um, unsupervised approach to text data exploration and uh, share a new, oh, well, share my feedback on um, a relatively new framework for um, topic discovery and also. Um, I guess discuss a little bit um, the caveats and um, pitfalls that can come, uh, you can come um, uh, along the way with the exploration. Uh, the um, so the, the the project was, as I mentioned, about um, uncovering some common themes in um, textual data. So the conversations were transcribed, and then we uh, were trying to um, investigate what it was about. And um, to uh, I'll, I'll schedule this talk around um, first mentioning what. Um, what is available for you um, if you're just starting with natural language processing and you want to explore your unlabeled data set. Um, so what are the common methods that um, people tend to use? What are the um, encodings that can help you along the way? Um, and as I mentioned, I'll focus on this new uh, framework for uh, exploration of um, text and conclude with the um, a few tips and reflections on um, how to frame yourself for success. So the problem that we have is we have a corpus of textual data, be it called transcripts or emails or reviews or um, any sort of textual data. And we don't have any labeled data. So we cannot say that, um, you know, if you're, if you're uh, familiar with the natural language processing field, uh, you may have heard of the um, famous 20 news groups data set that has a collection of um, emails of articles and um, they belong to um, a particular news group. So we have a collection that correspond to sport, uh, politics and so on. So you um, 
would not have anything like that for your problem. So you you just have this pile of documents and um, no hints or no directions to um, use to discover the uh, underlying themes. Um, uh, you may be, um, your use case may be um, suitable for um, the usage of commercial um, classification or um, categorization models. So for example, um, using DCP's uh, natural language processing um, APIs to predict a category, but it may not be um, feasible for your domain or it may be expensive um, for the problem that you're, that you're trying to solve. So um, very um, common approaches, and this is not an exhaustive list, there would be probably much, uh, many more um, techniques and approaches that you can use to discover um, the uh, underlying patterns in your textual data. But these are just a few highlights that um, I thought I'll discuss. Um, quite common, you can use um, clustering. So uh, you would think that surely, um, you know, conversations or documents that have similar text will be clustered together um, and potentially yes, but um, in my experience, clustering text can be, um, can be quite difficult. The reason for that is that when you um, cluster, for example, you cluster your user behaviors, um, how they behave on, the, on your website. So these are very um, understandable features. So every um, every feature means something. So, you know, um, users that log in after hours, users that um, spend that amount of time. So this is kind of easy to understand. Whereas with um, clustering text, you would encode the text and have uh, a vector representation of your um, document. And it typically has very high dimensionality. So understanding what's the importance of these dimensions for um, the particular clustering pattern is not necessarily intuitive. Um, the other downfall of clustering for um, clustering of textual data is that oh, clustering, so in general, that you need to know the number of clusters and to establish this number um, requires running um, clustering with several, um, several, over several iterations, um, trying to find the most optimal number of clusters. So that can be expensive for um, a large data set. Um, there's, um, if you don't know the number of clusters, there's a um, hierarchical clustering technique that um, would um, discover this for you. And then you, you just inspect the results of the model and you can, um, decide what's the optimal uh, number of clusters. And it is um, surprisingly useful for um, textual data, but it can be very expensive, again, because um, you need to um, keep this um, giant matrices in memory when you update every um, distance recalculation for every pairwise um, changes. So that can be quite um, computationally extensive. Um, the next very common technique for unsupervised um, text discovery would be um, topic modeling. And um, uh, specifically here, I'm focusing on latent direct allocation. And uh, this is a, a generative probabilistic model. And um, it sees a document as a, uh, uh, as a, collection of topics. So um, a document is represented by a, um, by a set of topics. And then a topic is a mixture of words. So you have these two distributions and you, um, the algorithm um, runs and run, runs and runs until it um, comes up with two probability distributions that are most likely to have created this document um, that you have. It, it is a, um, a widely used technique and it has unfortunately a downfall uh, and it's similar to um, clustering, you need to know the number of topics. Another uh, disadvantage of this method is that you would need to uh, have somebody to look at the topics and label them. So interpret what is this collection of words actually mean. So it's very useful for discovery. 
but it can be quite um, unfriendly when it comes to productionizing the solution because again if you have uh, documents that suddenly have a new topic you would need to think carefully how you detect this um, uh, drift in concepts in your model sorry in your data set and if your model is um, capable capable of recognizing the new um, topics nonetheless something to um, have in mind and use um, for initial exploration very useful um, another thing is and again we're talking here with the um, intention of analyzing unstructured data so um, just plain text and we don't know anything about this data set so um, extracting keywords and key phrases can be a very good first step to help you understand um, what's in your data um, there's a few examples so um, one example is um, a text rank algorithm and it's uh, very similar I think the implementation follows the or the logic um, incorporated in this algorithm follows the um, Google search page rank methodology or framework so um, it allows you to uncover key phrases alternatively you look at the um, collocation score so phrases that um, or words that happen together often um, will be identified as key phrases um, or some people even use um, splitting on stop words so if you have um, little chunks of like, phrases connected by stop words they will be um, identified this way if they're common enough and finally um, as I mentioned in the previous slide if your domain is um, suitable or if, if it is uh, if you're lucky and your documents are in um, this very general um, like it uses gen general English and it's nothing specific like um, banking or insurance um, language and um, labels that you're interested in. You may um, have some luck with exploring um, cloud providers and their pre-trained um, models for categorization. So here I have a little snippet and I'm not sure if you can see, but these are examples of um, categories that you can extract using um, Google's AutoML NLP categorization API. Um, so it, it can be quite specific and um, in quite specific and not necessarily specific enough for your domain. So here we say um, shopping toys, building toys. So like not every data set unfortunately um, cares about these categories um, and these are just some examples uh, but something to have in mind so next I want to say um, just a few words and um, about encoding and um, the reason I want to say this is if you are new to natural language processing and um, like you're not just extracting keywords or key phrases and you want to actually um, train some um, unsupervised learning model uh, you would most likely need to encode your data set so um, convert it to um, a numerical representation that is digestible by um, algorithms that you're planning to use and the very simple um, encoding method um, that uh, can be used for uh, this task would be one hot encoding um, and it's just a, an encoding of um, document where you split it into individual words and then each word is represented as a um, y by n, by n vector and your uh, n is the number of words so uh, you would basically have this um, giant matrix of zeros and um, mostly zeros and ones sometimes. And um, it, given the size of the data set, it, depending on the size of the data set you have, it may be um, not very convenient to use and not very um, effective. But it is um, often mentioned as like one of the most basic ones. Um, the next step would be to use a bag of words and make it um, to make it a little bit less sparse. So what you'll do is you get a set of unique words, so a set of words, which is um, unique words in your document, and 
um, encode every document um, using these vectors where elements of the vector would be counts of this unique words. And bag of words is a very um, simple and uh, uh, I guess effective model. Um, it can be um, used for any um, initial exploration and um, with varying results, but quite often it's not too bad. Um, the disadvantage of bag of words is that it doesn't um, preserve the spatial information, so we don't get any information about uh, the word order because it is all discarded and you have just a bag of words, so just a collection of um, uh, unique words. Bag of words is uh, a, it can be seen as an n-gram model where n is one, so an n-gram is a, um, a collection of words that follow each other, so um, Imagine you have a sentence, you have a sliding window of uh, two, this will be, this would result in two uh, biograms. So to combat a little bit the, or to add a bit more information to the bag of words encoding, um, you may want to use an n-gram encoding where you have the sliding window. So instead of having unigrams, you'll have biograms and so on. And this will uh, preserve a little bit of information. Um, the next um, very common encoding um, for large data sets of uh, many documents and um, documents that consist of a uh, large number of words would be um, term frequency inverse document frequency or TFIDF. And uh, this encoding is um, quite common in information retrieval. Um, and it just helps you um, separate uh, important words from less important and important is importance is assessed by the frequency of this document uh, of this sorry words and the prevalence of documents with these words so it naturally balances out uh, words that are way too common and finally the uh, the last uh, type of encoding that i want to mention uh, would be embeddings or um, distributional semantic models and uh, these that they are about I guess they uh, they, uh, they were introduced back in I guess 2013 or um, around that time so they, they've been here for a while now and um, the quite common uh, commonly known one is um, word to vec which was a big um, thing back in the day when it was released and um, it the um, these encodings or sorry em embeddings um, or models they um, do because of the way they're trained um, or they are created uh, they preserve some semantic information so um, it's a significant significant improvement over a plain bag of words model and um, they are a uh, byproduct of training a model to um, predict either a word given the context or the context given a word or um, with another model which is GLOVE um, there's actually a slightly different approach for um, creating these word vectors um, and it's more uh, um, based on statistics and trying to find a vector that will uh, maximize the probability of words co-occurrence in a big corpus of textual data. So, um, as I mentioned, um, word to vec and GLOVE are quite common and um, they have been around for a while. And they, back in the day, they were really, really a big breakthrough. So every um, blog or medium blog or uh, and a core blog will have or questions will have um, those visualizations of word to vec, how they work and how they preserve the um, semantics and the relationships between um, the word embeddings. Um, unfortunately, um, they not always work as intended. So here I was trying to um, do the same, but for um, broccoli and vegetarian and the relation to chicken, uh, unfortunately the model um, didn't do just as well as with uh, king and queen, queen examples. 
Um, but in general, um, overall, these models are quite useful for um, preserving some semantics. And um, if you have similar words, they will potentially be in the same vector space. The thing to be um, careful about word embeddings uh, is that they, as they are trained on the data generated by humans, they adopt all the biases um, that this um, data sets contain. So um, there are plenty of examples where, um, you know, with translations and so on, uh, they will carry over the um, gender biases or um, similar, so something to be aware of. Um, and the big disadvantage of these models is that they do not, they do preserve some semantics, but they do not carry different um, encodings for a word depending on um, what is, what's the meaning of that word. So um, a good example is a bank, so a financial institution or a river bank. So um, word to that will just have one representation. Um, and one interesting thing is that when they, this, uh, the um, embeddings were released, uh, there's only that, that far you can go with encoding your document and have like a, a vector for every word in your document. And um, so of course, it was not necessarily easy to, uh, it would work well for classifying a document, but um, maybe not necessarily as well uh, for you know finding similar documents um, people used to sum them up and think that or you know if you sum up all the vectors that represent um, each word in a sentence you'll get a sentence vector so this is something to be um, aware of it's not going to work because you can sum as many vectors and arrive at the same point and then have a different combination of vectors and still arrive, arrive at the same point so uh, it's uh, not an, it, uh, I've seen examples of um, blogs and uh, projects where they were used in this way. It's something to be mindful about. Um, and uh, while we're talking about embeddings, um, one thing to note is that around 2018, um, there was a um, another round of, um, I, I guess, progress in natural language processing, and um, it was the time of uh, the release of Elmo and Bert, and these are uh, a more complex um, models and um, uh, designed to, oh, sorry, models that were um, created uh, and can be used for um, the contextual, um, and, and sorry, encoding of words. Uh, in sentences depending on the context so they are more complex than word to vec and normally would involve very um, sophisticated uh, neural network architecture and um, would cope with distinguishing uh, between different meanings of a word given the context so um, they uh, there's more models not just Elmo and Bird the, there are no variations of Bird called um, uh, Roberta or um, Electro and so on. So these are just two um, big examples. And finally, one other thing that I wanted to mention is the um, universal sentence encoder. And um, this is very useful for when you, when I was just talking about um, coming up with a vector that would represent your sentence or a document instead of summing up individual vectors. Um, Universal Sentence Encoder is a great model for encoding your uh, text or strings that are longer than just one word. So encoding phrases is useful, encoding sentences, or even small paragraphs. And um, the reason I actually focus on um, Universal Sentence Encoder is that it can be helpful for unsupervised exploration of your textual data. So as a data scientist, you have your um, corpus of documents and you want to quickly test some hypothesis. So in my case, I was looking at phone conversations and I was curious, hmm, I wonder how many calls actually have references to um, that, particular, that, that particular sentence or that particular um, phrase. And that was very helpful to quickly discover and 
um, finding in examples of um, a particular phrase or sentence I was after. So rather than doing um, exact search or fuzzy search, um, using this uh, universal sentence encoder for semantic search is very useful. Um, and this is actually what I was just <laughs> talking about. Sorry, I should have flicked uh, earlier to this slide. So here I was looking for um, cases where people would be saying that I don't want to be contacted. So I was looking for stop calling me and I used um, a non-metric, uh, and I'm asleep, non-metric uh, library. Um, it has an implementation of approximate nearest neighbor. So what I did is I um, encoded sentences in my um, small data set. I, I took a sample of calls and I, I split it into sentences and every call, sorry, I split every call into sentences and encoded each sentence using universal sentence encoder. And then I uh, indexed my vector space of the sentences um, using um, an approximate nearest neighbors implementation. And through this, I was able to um, find instances of sentences that were um, similar to stop calling me or fraudulent transaction. So this is very fast and um, quite handy. So through this, I was able to find um, examples of conversations where um, certain sentences were appearing and perhaps they were paraphrased in some ways. Um, so that helped me to um, test as I said, test hypothesis about the calls and review the um, calls that would have specific references so that I could um, develop a um, like small semi-labeled data set. I will um, so, uh, share this a little bit later um, in the notebook that I have that I want to share. Um, and finally, um, I go to the talk to Vex. So, um, Top to Vec is a framework that was um, published last year and it's available open source on um, GitHub so you can have a look and use for your uh, applications. Um, and it is quite simple conceptually and a surprisingly um, useful um, for data exploration. Um, I would say that it's not the best tool for using in production and it's not the silver uh, bullet that will solve all the problems of unsupervised um, topic modeling, but uh, it can be very useful for um, for a data scientist um, trying to make some sense from the calls, oh sorry, calls, documents and uh, calls as well. Uh, and uh, get some hints of where to focus your attention on. So the idea behind the top to deck is that um, if you have a an, an embedding framework, so you can encode your words and you can encode your documents, then it must be that a document that contains these words will have a very similar um, oh, area, sorry, we'll have an area in the vector space where these words will be um, nearby as well. So here um, on this example, we have um, blue circles would be documents that mention something about um, what to expect when you're applying for a credit card, what things like that. And um, at the same time, you'll have words that we have would be embedded using the same framework and there will um, be nearby as well. So you will have a, um, uh, let's say, a cloud of data points in your vector space for documents and words, and they will be um, close to each other if they are similar. So this is the general idea. Now, the next step is um, to fight the uh, Fastness. So, because Universal Sentence Encoder has uh, 512 dimensions. Um, well, sorry, this is one example. You can use um, Universal Sentence Encoder as your um, uh, vector representation framework. Um, you can use others. So, I'm using here a 500, uh, Universal Sentence Encoder, which has 512 dimensions. So, um, Regardless of what um, encoding method you'll use, you would still want to reduce the dimensionality. And 
um, the author of this package um, is using a uniform manifold approximation and projection library and it's also available on github um, and the idea is that um, through reducing the dimensionality you will be able to find areas um, of high density so um, the image here is to illustrate the um, sparsity of the documents in your vector space. So the final step is to actually, um, once we reduce the dimensionality, is to find the areas of um, high density. And for that, the hierarchical density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise is used. So this is um, HDB scan, another um, open sourced um, library that was used by the creator of top to back And um, the emphasis here is that it is hierarchical. So you don't need to know the um, number of clusters. So you um, discover the clusters based on the set of parameters. So um, uh, yeah, this way you don't have to bound yourself by the number of clusters similar to other clustering um, techniques. So once we have these areas of um, high density, we say, okay, we see this as a topic and we, um, so each dot would be um, a topic. So what I'm saying is this, the colored, um, colored areas would be um, areas of high density and um, everything outside of that is seen as an outlier so documents that do not get to um, influence our topic um, cluster and then within this colored blob uh, you would find a centroid and say so this centroid is my um, topic and the word um, dots that are around the centroid will be seen as the words that describe my topic and so through this, you can uh, identify which new documents belong to which cluster and what are the words that are describing it. So this library has some uh, additional methods for, um, and I'll show, you, uh, we'll talk about them in a moment, um, but um, the, um, Disadvantage of this um, library at the moment that I see is that it's a little bit hard to parameterize it. So um, a lot of these uh, parameters for uh, dimensionality reduction and for clustering, they are hard coded in the code. So you as a user of the library, you cannot really pass them on and um, configure it yourself. So um, I, I believe that potentially when this package gains popularity, it will, possibly be made, um, uh, it will be supported. As of now, you just, if you uh, need to parameterize it, you can just parameterize the um, um, installed code in your environment. Um, and another disadvantage is, uh, and this is why I was saying that it's probably not the best tool for production, is that uh, you, assume that your short sorry you assume that your document only covers one topic so because a document um unlike lda uh, um, approach where you believe that a document is a blend of topics here a document is one topic so a document would likely be um isolated and you'll have to say that okay this is most likely topic so um you lose some of the information and another caveat is that um the idea of universal sentence encoder is also that you use it on short paragraphs. So if you have a very long um, uh, document, it's unlikely to work because it will just um, lose the um, level of details. So nonetheless, I use it for my exploration and um, for uh, the data sets. As I mentioned, I had about 400 documents and I, managed to run top to back and um, it took a little time and thankfully I had enough resources to actually um, fit it all into memory and run but um, after a while I 
you've got uh, 1500 topics and it's not surprising I would say because it's a large data set and as I guess it's fair to say that the topics that are identified by top to back are not necessarily topics that we understand um, should be a topic. So thankfully the library has um, a method for compacting this uh, uh, topic cluster. So what you do is you run, I think it is called hierarchical clustering again, and it groups similar um, topics. So after regrouping, I've got um, 400 topics, which was more um, feasible but uh, or easier to work with. But even with 400, I only had um, the, I guess, capacity to label only the top 50 ones. And uh, because not all of them actually make sense, I, um, this one here is an example of a topic that contained all those words. So um, remember those dots that are around um, the documents and from here you can say that okay documents that belong to topic one are likely to be about fraudulent transactions or fraudulent operations um, and some kind of investigations which was great because um, from there I could understand um, where to focus my attention like how many discussions were actually covering this and um, it gave me an idea where to um, go afterwards. So now I will quickly switch to my notebook where I just want to share um, pretty much what I did with the actual project but with the um, a dummy data set. So uh, I am um, using, what is it, it's a little too small. So I am using um, TensorFlow Hub, uh, well, I was using TensorFlow Hub Universal Sentence Encoder. So um, in this case, I'm just using the um, um, local copy of the model. And I'm using, as I said, top to back and uh, also um, a dummy data set. So I am using Stack Exchange um, data set. You can find it on Archive and it's um, a very nice um, data set to work with. Um, I'll, Sorry, I just scroll, scroll here to sh say what I mean. So um, I used um, a small subset of forums or um, you know question websites. So I'm using uh, this set of uh, documents, and my data set consists of only um, questions. So I have a question, and I believe that question belongs to a topic. So uh, with this space one, so um, this comes from. Uh, space stack exchange so i believe okay this should be uh, a space topic so i am loading these documents and um i have about equal number of questions per forum and my naive expectation would be that oh surely like i have here what 12 topics i should probably have 12 actually maybe it's more sorry I'm not sure three Oh, yes, 12. Um, I should probably have 12 topics. Um, unfortunately, no. And uh, this is similar to my 1500 topics that I discovered in the actual data set. So, uh, no, and I'll um, we'll have a look at why. But before that, I just wanted to quickly share that I, um, how I create the index. So, uh, as I mentioned, I am using um, a library. Uh, oh, Sorry, I'm using the uh, NMS Lib library that uses hierarchical navigable, navigable small world um, approximate nearest neighbors technique. So uh, you may have heard of Anoi, which is a library um, released by Spotify back in the day, and it's also for approximate nearest neighbors. And um, this one is slightly different, and I find it to be a little bit faster than Anoi and uh, a little bit more accurate. Um, I'm fairly sure that uh, NMS Lib and um, this implementation of um, approximate nearest neighbors is used in, uh, used by AWS for one of their services. I, it slipped my mind. I think it was um, Amazon Elasticsearch, if it's the one. Uh, I'll have to um, clarify that, I don't remember. Um, but yeah, so this is the index I created and 
using universal standards encoder, I can actually search for uh, questions that are similar. So here I was looking at how to build an elevator through space and unsurprisingly, there were questions in Stack Overflow um, that were asking the same thing or, or similar. Um, uh, yes, so um, if, as I said, if I were working on a client project, this would give me some hints as to um, which document to inspect and um, find examples of my, or, or I find evidence of some um, sentences or discussions. So that can be very useful um, when you look for examples to create a synthetically labeled data set. Now with the talk to that, I um, said that I want to use universal sentence encoder and create a talk to that with my forum documents and uh, what it does, it, it encodes individual words and encodes every document using universal sentence encoder. And then um, does the dimensionality reduction and then finds the dense areas as we just discussed and tries to find topics. And I ended up with 16 topics. Oh, that's an improvement. Um, over 12, which is not too bad at all. And um, let's have a look at the um, what were the topics. So uh, to remind you, the documents I was using were from one of the stock exchange forums was about cooking and coffee and beers. And um, the most common topic was about uh, espresso and brewing and beer. And I guess it makes sense because you brew beer and you brew coffee. So um, this shows how our understanding of topics, like we understand that brewing is a concept, but um, then the, there are details that are brewing different sorts of drinks. So here they are actually all mixed together. For some reason, we have uh, artificial here as well. Uh, I'm not sure why, but um, that can happen. So the next common topic is about um, created visa and travel and you see algorithm. And I think this would be coming from, uh, sorry, I just want to check. Uh, okay, AI beer coffee, crypto. So let's see, oh yeah, cool. Crypto and travel, that's right. So um, when people travel, they talk about cards potentially. When people talk about cards, they can talk about money. And when people um, talk about cryptocurrencies, they would talk about similar things and they would probably mention algorithms. So um, this was recognized as another topic. Um, finally, the last one that I will um, look at is the uh, anything to do with uh, space. And for some reason, spacecraft, which is a game, is identified here as well, which is a little bit funny, but um, it just shows that in some documents, they potentially spoke about similar things. So that's why the algorithm decides that it is um, that topic. Um, right, so uh, with this um, library, you can find um, topics given a keyword. So here um, you can say like, oh, give me all the uh, topics that would be somewhat close to um, Xbox. So here we see we have the topic uh, number six, which talks about um, Starcraft and games, which are um, which is which comes from the gaming stock exchange and uh, Xbox Xbox as well. Um, and the next one would be um, surprisingly guitar and piano, but not surprisingly as well because often Xbox will be discussed in well not often but most of the time in the context of gaming and. Um, gaming would potentially involve um, playing and playing would involve guitar or piano. So this is how it all gets uh, intertwined together. Uh, and um, you can also search um, documents by topic that's already mentioned and um, you can find examples of documents by topic. So I'll so give me all the documents that um, belong to topic eight and I find um, topic eight was probably about artificial intelligence. So um, these are the examples of questions or documents in my case. 
and you can find documents by keyword. So here I would be looking at um, documents that would have Xbox. I think it would be a coincidence that Xbox is actually mentioned. I think it is um, supposed to, uh, you know, find even those documents that are not necessarily mentioning Xbox. Um, something to look into. And uh, yeah, you can also find um, words in your data set that are close to a particular word. So here I was looking for space and you can find all the similar words. Um, and of course it would be uh, dependent on your project whether you see uh, what cutoffs are good or bad. So here the cutoff is, the, the greater it is, the closer it is to your um, keyword. And this was the uh, way to reduce the number of topics. So you say I want to reduce it from 16 down to um, 10 because you see this is the number of forums that you have. Um, yes, the, all of this is based on the um, GitHub repository that uh, has all the examples of how to use top to deck. And finally, um, what I wanted to say is when you work on a project where you need to do an unsupervised um, discovery uh, or an unsupervised um, modeling over your data, it is, it can be tricky and it can be tricky to um, find the boundary of the project and understand um, how to frame it so that it is actually successful and useful. So the, uh, I guess, obvious problem that I see with unsupervised techniques applied for um, real world business problems is that um, business stakeholders would have a very clear expectation of what um, their business taxonomy is. So somebody would say, um, you know, I have, I'm selling an, um, general insurance, so I expect some documents to fall under car insurance, some documents to fall under um, contents insurance, but then when you do your unsupervised exploration, you end up with this clusters of, um, you know, uh, I don't know, something, um, take out insurance that doesn't necessarily fall under um, either one of those, or you would um, have some discussions of premiums and so on. So it doesn't necessarily fit um, with the um, expectation of the business stakeholders um, and their understanding of the business um, ontology. So that can be tricky um, to um, explain and understand that there can be this discrepancy. So it is important to set expectations very early on and uh, be upfront and um, agree that the unsupervised approach is not necessarily going to uh, end up in the topics that match um, the business um, vocabulary, business um, structure or business taxonomy. Um, and quite often productionizing this for, particularly for uh, text can be also quite challenging. Um, what you can do if you're a data scientist and you are um, tasked with exploring this unlabeled data set, um, you could try and understand the context as much as possible. Um, it's always a good idea, but here it's particularly important. So uh, understand what's the story behind this data. How was it, how was it generated? Was it um, generated, uh, is it actively generated? Is it somebody who calls and talks to the person? Because this can give you a little bit of understanding. Okay, if people have an option to go through online self-serve or they choose to call, so typically people that call will probably want to resolve it quickly. So it must be something uh, important that requires immediate attention. So this is why they choose to call. So you can say, um, okay, so potentially this would include issues like for example, reporting fraud or um, you know, being charged for something that they don't quite understand why. So this gives you a little bit of hints of where to focus your attention when um, performing an unsupervised discovery. Um, another thing that I, I forgot to mention before, um, regarding the expectations of reality, um, one of the common um, problems is that people also oh, sorry, often have um, some pre-existing beliefs of what um, machine learning and AI can do. And um, that's why there's the discrepancy of the um, reality of um, patterns that are 
important for an algorithm, but less important for business. Um, next thing that you can do is you can ask or try and frame your pro uh, problem um, with specific questions in mind, rather than here's the data, see what's possible or see what patterns you can come up with. Um, it can work, but more often not. And um, thing is that you may be refining your unsupervised approach more and more up to the point where you can actually spend all this time just reading or inspecting the data manually um, and summarizing it all in your own words. So um, the question should probably be specific. For example, if the business is trying to understand how often do people um, call to submit a complaint, then you would be focusing on exploring your data with this um, question in mind so you can um, get very specific answers with that and uh, they will still be approximate but the um sorry the question would be specific the answers would be approximate but they would um at least align with the expectations of the business and also it is um, a good idea to try and get your hands on any um metadata or additional data available. So quite often um, the, it is very likely that um, these data sets exist and uh, due to the sizes of the organization, some actually lose sight of it, but it could be very helpful. So for example, in um, my case, it was very helpful to um, get access to um, recording metadata and understand which cues the call was um, sent through. So this gives you a additional understanding and some um, uh, food for thought, and you can understand that um, these are general um, cues that people um, go and they reflect of um, people's problems that they wish to um, discuss and questions. And um, often it is important to understand what is for this given data set, what is actually irrelevant. So in my case, the, um, in, my, in my data set, I have uh, many calls that would contain some pre-recorded messages and these would be very important pre-recorded messages, but um, I didn't know that they are so prevalent in the data set that um, the model should not be focusing on it. Um, sorry, they were not um, too prevalent. They were quite common, but not um, like they were not, you know, of the frequency of stop words, uh, but they should be seen as um, um, chunks that I need to ignore just because they're not um, important for the business. Yeah, I guess. That, oh, right. Um, with, the, with this, um, what we actually arrived at is that um, the unsupervised approach is really, really powerful for um, getting your um, understanding of the data of the data and what it is about. But um, for business to get um, some very practical value out of uh, their data, it is um, quite relevant and quite important to have a human in the loop. So um, use all the learnings that are um, obtained from the unsupervised discovery um, to help a human with curating the data set. And uh, even with the small data sets um, with some examples of the um, main themes that the business is interested in, um, you can build a, a much more um, palatable, uh, uh, sorry, much more business friendly models with uh, results that are um, easy to understand and consume and that are relevant for the business. So um, using semi-supervised uh, learning techniques. Yes, and I reached the end of my uh, topic and we still have time for questions. Happy to take your questions. Unfortunately, I cannot see if there are any questions. Um, Kate, could you please tell me if there are any? Hi, Marie. Hi, Marie. Marina. Again, yeah, no, no questions at the moment. Okay. Well, feel free to ask any. If you later remember any questions, feel free to reach out separately. But and then by email or LinkedIn.
Great. I think we'll wrap up there then and any questions can come through to you directly. Cool. Hey, well, thank you very much for coming today. I hope you learned something new.